we continue in the book of Philippians, uh, now down to chapter 3, as Paul begins to change uh, some of the topics that he's talking about. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 11 for you. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus and have put no confidence in the flesh. Well, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. And indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. From some years ago, when I was an associate pastor in Westminster, California, my, my senior pastor and friend, Ken Harper, got invited to speak to a, a... Oops, oops. I can assure you that was not him. There we go. Sometimes like Peter has a mind of its own. Uh, Ken Harper got invited to speak uh, to a group of Church of Christ pastors on C.S. Lewis. Ken had, had a great interest in Lewis, had become kind of, of an expert on him. And so he went and had a great presentation. And there was a lot of really good interaction with those in attendance. And at the end, there was a, a lot of appreciative thank yous and handshaking. But in the midst of all of this, one of them asked Ken a question. Uh, Reverend Harper, have you been baptized by full immersion? Well, Ken said, no, I'm, I'm a run-of-the-mill Presbyterian who's been baptized by sprinkling. And to this, the person responded, well, you know, without full immersion baptism, you're going to hell. Um, now, now, Ken probably kept his cool a lot better than I would have. And, I, and he knew that a spontaneous theological debate would get nowhere, so he simply said, thank you, I'll take my chances. Now, many in the Church of Christ are part of a movement called the Restoration Movement, that insists that full immersion baptism is needed uh, for cleansing of sin. And without it, uh, no matter what you believe, salvation in Jesus Christ is not open to you. Now, obviously, not many other Christians agree with this, even if we do believe baptism is important. But it highlights a problem had in the Philippian church almost 2,000 years ago. There are some Christians who think that faith in Jesus Christ, even radical faith, is not enough. I mentioned at the beginning of the series that we believe most of the Philippian Christians came from a non-Jewish background. They were Greek-speaking and Greek-cultured and probably knew fairly little about Judaism. Uh, we never actually found uh, a synagogue in Philippi. Um, but you may also, uh, but you also have to remember that uh, uh, that as the early church grew, uh, many people in the church didn't see themselves as distinct from Judaism. They simply believed that they were now Jews who recognized Jesus as God's promised Messiah and hoped that all Jews would come to this understanding. Some of them came to believe that as Greek uh, non-Jews or Gentiles came into the church, they would also need to obey many of the Old Testament and Jewish cultural laws to please God and be a part of God's people, just like Jewish converts had done before Jesus. And well, that included circumcision for men. Now, a council in Jerusalem recorded in Acts 15, uh, well before this letter, I might add, would conclude that this was not the case. Gentiles did not need to follow Old Testament ceremonial laws. But it appeared that some Jewish Christians either didn't get the memo or they chose to ignore it. And they traveled to many local churches that Paul had started 
telling them they needed, men needed to be circumcised, and they all needed to follow Jewish law, especially dietary law. We now call them Judaizers. Um, Paul knows that among Greeks, uh, I'm sorry, that among Jews, circumcision is a big deal. I mean, before he takes Greek Timothy with him as his fellow missionary, we talked about how important Timothy was last week, he actually has him circumcised. And I have to say that is true commitment to the mission field. Um, now, it may be that when Epaphroditus came to Paul in Rome from Philippi, he brought word that Philippi had been visited by some of these Judaizers and that now they were confused or concerned by some of their claims. You know, do, do we have to be circumcised? Do we have to follow Jewish law? So Paul brings out his big guns and uses some of the sharpest language and criticism uh, in any of his letters on that. It starts at the beginning of this verse. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And as a safeguard for you, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who worship, who, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Pretty strong words, right? Now, you need to understand that the term dogs is not just a generic insult. In, in the first century, uh, Jews routinely referred to non-Jews as dogs. In, in fact, there was a prayer that many Jewish men recited every morning, and they still recite a, a version of it today, that included the line, Lord, I thank you that you did not make me a Gentile. But in practice, they would pray, Lord, I thank you that you did not make me a dog. Dog meaning a non-Jew. That's how much hostility there was. So when Paul calls the Judaizers dogs, he's reversing their argument. They're now the ones who are outside God's family because they're telling Christians there's something more to salvation than grace in Jesus Christ. And that's why he says, for it is we who are the circumcision. That's the uncircumcised Philippian Christians who are now the real followers of God, not them. Then Paul goes on for a long list of his own accomplishments and his status from a Jewish point of view, from a human point of view. From a human point of view, I was the best of the best of the Jews. And if these external things had the power to save, well, I had them all. But then he goes on to say how worthless all of those human accomplishments and were. Um, verses 7 through 9. But whatever was my profit, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which is found in faith in Christ, by righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. And then you know, it begins the heart of the passage. And I want you to see how Paul contrasts his old life with his new Christ. He does it really four times in four ways. You know, whatever it was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of knowing Christ. Again, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I have lost all things that I may gain Christ. And then finally, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. And let me point out here that the old King James probably got the translation uh, better, more correct than, than most of the newer translations do. Uh, the King James translated this, I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And yeah, that's what Paul really says. And then Paul finishes up with this thought. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection of you want to know what's important to Paul and, and then hopefully what he hopes is important to the Philippians and hopefully to all of us that in every way, in all we are, in all we hold dear, in all we sacrifice for, it's Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, friends, every time you're tempted to think that there is something in your life that's more important than Jesus, go back and read this and be reminded how important Jesus ought to be to a true Christian. We forget that sometimes. My friends, I want to start wrapping up with two brief applications and then one final point. First, be careful about people who tell me 
that faith in Je- tell you that faith in Jesus Christ is, is not simply enough. For the most part, uh, not many will tell you what my friend Ken was told. Uh, that if he did one specific ritual in a certain way, he was, uh, if he didn't, he was then destined for eternal punishment. But let me tell you, you will find good Christians who will convince themselves that there is something else you need to make you a real Christian. And I'll bet you've all run into them in one way or the other. You know, I know mothers have been told if they don't homeschool their kids, they're not really committed Christian. I, I know people who told me that if, if you couldn't be a Christian but not be crusading against abortion. I've heard people say that you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat, or be a Republican, or be a capitalist, or be a communist. I was told by fellow student in seminary that if I didn't speak in tongues, I wasn't really a Christian. And I spent a very uncomfortable night one time with some very nice, very committed, charismatic Roman Catholic Christians trying to convince me that the only way for me to be a really faithful follower of Jesus Christ was also to venerate the Virgin Mary. And the list is endless. And often these people, I would tell you, most of the time they have the best of intentions. But somebody once said that the minute you say you need Jesus and, you know, fill in the blank, you lapse into idolatry because you've essentially placed something of worship alongside the worship of Jesus and his work at the cross, and I think they're right. Remember, Paul's word to the Philippians, righteousness comes only through faith in Jesus Christ, nothing else, nothing else. Not that other things are important. Nothing is more important. Nothing else is needed. So second, don't believe for a moment there is anything else other than radical faith in Jesus Christ that ultimately makes you fit for heaven. Judaizers thought following the Jews' law was what made you right with God. And I'll tell you, you know, we don't have Judaizers much anymore, but, you know, we have that popular mantra, you know, what do you need in life? Well, just be kind or just live a good life. You know, these two ideas have a common thread. Find some human action or behavior that will accomplish your salvation by your effort. Now let me tell you, this doesn't say that how we live doesn't matter, because it definitely does. But however good we are, we can never be good enough to save ourselves. If Paul, with all his accomplishments, couldn't do it without Jesus, neither can we, or neither can anybody else. Let me tell you, a couple times in discussions and debates with non-Christians, people have asked me what I I consider... um, for them to be what they think is a gotcha question. You know that one question that if I ask you, it's going to screw up your whole you know, line of thought. And the question is, is Gandhi in heaven or hell? Now, because if you say in heaven, well, then it looks like being good is all you need to satisfy God. It's essentially salvation by works. But if you say hell, well, then you look like a major jerk and you're discredited because what kind of a jerk would say a guy like Gandhi is in hell, Right? And this is what I answered them. I said, I don't know, because that's between him and God. But if he is in heaven, it's because at some point in his life, as he studied the life of Jesus Christ, and he did, because most of his great ideas come from the Gospels, he decided to give his life to Jesus and follow him. And besides, do you really want to say that to get into heaven, you need to lead as morally stringent a life as Gandhi? Because if that's the standard, heaven's going to be pretty empty. Being good is important, but you can't good life your way into heaven without Jesus Christ. It's more than just be nice. And finally, friends, let me talk honestly about something we we don't often talk about. I know there are all times that we all privately think about what we have given up to follow Jesus. I wonder if it was worth it. At the very least, we sometimes honestly admit a little bit of jealousy over the things that we might have done Uh, or have had uh, if we were not followers of Jesus. Uh, Some of you may remember, if you're an old buzzer like me, uh, a guy named Mike Iaconelli, who founded Youth Specialties, was a writer for the Wittenberg Door way back in the 70s and 80s. I remember listening to him speak at a conference where he told the story of how shocked the men in his small group at his church that he was pastoring were when he admitted that he was sometimes jealous of all the sexual encounters that his non-Christian friends had in college and young adulthood, but he had refrained from because of his, his faith. And nobody wanted to hear that. And, and frankly, I appreciate that kind of honesty because the truth is that everyone who follows Jesus gives up earthly things to do so. 
earthly things that actually often look pretty attractive. I, I know that if you are a faithful Christian, you've given up most of your Sunday mornings, weekends away, many days and evenings in worship and study and service for the sake of God and your relationship to him. You have given money that could just as easily have been spent on things for yourself or to make your life more easy. You have avoided things that the world finds deeply pleasurable. And there are probably people around that think you're nuts for having done so. And you have adopted a worldview and a lifestyle that probably has kept you from promotions at work or from fashionable social circles or for positions of prominence or being a part of the in crowd or the inner circle. And I want you all to come to the same decision about that that Mike Iaconelli came to, and really which the Apostle Paul articulated so well, that all those things, however good and tempting and wonderful they be, or more accurately, more accurately appear to be, that all of those things are worthless compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. And I pray that in your hearts that you will have the same longing and hope that Paul ends this section with. For he says, I want to know Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, and becoming like him in death, somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Let that be our hope. Let that be our goal. Let that be what guides our life. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for Paul's witness and reminder that the world calls out to us in so many ways. In some ways, people tell us who, who are, are maybe faithful followers of Christ, that we need something more than just faith to be accepted by you and your Father. Others in the world tell us that, well, all these things don't matter, and just be nice and get what you can. And, and sometimes we're caught between the two poles. Father, remind us again indeed that all these things in our world, all these extraneous things in our life are worthless compared to to the surpassing wonder and knowledge of knowing you and you in your life and your death and in your resurrection so that we may also have you on our life and in our death and in our resurrection. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us? Bye. 
soul is satisfied in Him alone. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. Love that song. Friends, go from this place knowing that there is nothing else other than Jesus Christ that really, really matters. May his grace, his mercy, his peace, and his presence, the great promises he has for us, be with you now and forevermore.